ahead and get started. Um, my name is Darcy Roscoe. I am standing in as your uh, MC for the day, and it is my honor to share with you um, a little bit about what the series is about, and then to introduce our two speakers. So these what matters what matters to me talks started last year. For those of you who came last year, welcome back. Um, for those of you who are brand new, this is an, an opportunity for just a short break for faculty, staff, and students to take a break from their busy day, engage in good conversation, and hear what's important and what really matters to some of the people who have devoted their lives to different aspects of what it really means to be part of higher education. Um, what Matters to Me talks will occur on four dates this fall, October 3rd, November 1st, and November 29th. Um, our speakers oftentimes um, volunteer based on their schedule or are coerced into <laughs> based on the needs of the schedule. So sometimes their, their, their talks match together beautifully. Other times they have nothing to do with each other. But as you probably learned throughout your own, the course of your own education, oftentimes you can find things that make connections that suddenly make something appear crystal clear to you, sort of a transformational experience while you're listening to it and drawing connections between the two. I've had the uh, privilege of already seeing their bios, so I have already noticed an overlap, at least in the backgrounds of our two speakers. Um, so, the form, so the format for these, they're kind of like TED Talks. What happens is um, one person, one of our speakers will speak first, um, will clap, then there'll be an awkward pause. Well, people get more snacks and we reload um, the, uh, the PowerPoint. They've got a different PowerPoint. And then we start again. And then when we get to the end, there's time for question and answer. And the question and answer part is really the most powerful part of this experience. It's the part where community happens. It's the part where people engage. It's the part where sometimes people discover they've got something in common with somebody in the audience from what what is generated in conversation, and it's the start of a whole new relationship, or inspire somebody to volunteer for one of those wonderful times on the calendar when we just don't happen to have a speaker. So, um, our first speaker. Um, I'm gonna make her come up here and stand so you can stare at her. Yes! While <laughs> I do the bio. Okay, so first, a confidence clap to welcome. Sarah Slagle rhymes with bagel. She has been teaching math for 10 years total and has been working at FRCC since 2015. She sponsors the super awesome cool math club here at Front Range Community College. And the next meeting is October 2nd. If any of you after today feel totally inspired to jump on the math train and ride that train as far as it'll go. We'll be talking about bats and bat flight pattern and echolocation. Ah, what could be better in the month of October? Um, she also has a math parody YouTube channel, and she has done some national speaking at online conferences about how music and math enhances learning. Um, if you have not seen the most recent video that um, includes some, many members of our math department, um, it's amazing how much musical talent there is math, I'm looking for some more dancing, and, and dancing is also part of her background. She used to compete and teach country line dancing, swing, cha-cha, waltz, etc. Yeah. Um, she also runs obstacle courses, which is, is terrifying, um, and, um, ow. and, and um, she has a, a dog named Delta for mathematics. And um, Otis. Otis is also a dog. Yep. Uh, Not uh, in for math, though. <laughs> English, no idea. <laughs> but math club, yes. <laughs> um, so I believe also that I remember from when we were interviewing you that you are a Fort Collins native. I am. So we have a, a homegrown product right here at Fort Collins. <laughs> Please welcome our first speaker, Sarah Slake. Yeah, you have to participate. Um, if you could talk about uh, what you're currently reading or what genres of books you like to read. Just take a second. Give me a second. Go. All right. I know, 
right? Not to clap for people. All right, sorry about that delay there. Um, so my name is Sarah Slagle, and thanks for giving me a second there to get ready. Um, I teach math, so when I was asked to talk about what matters to me, I thought this would be a great time to talk about mathematics, <laughs> um, obviously. Um, so if you could, I want you to talk again to your neighbors, and I want you to just real brief, I want everyone to have a chance to share. Um, I just want you to give a real brief, how are you feeling about mathematics? Is there something from your past that influenced the way you feel? Be honest with your neighbors. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry if not everybody got their time to share, maybe as much as they had wanted. But I heard some interesting things as I was wandering around. I picked up on a couple key words. So just out of interest, um, you might accidentally call your neighbor out right now. I thought we were going to maybe be in table groups. This would have worked slightly differently. But um, raise your hand if someone nearby you said something negative about mathematics. Okay. <laughs> Something negative. I see a lot of hands raised. Um, you know, I'm going to question perhaps if maybe more than one person around you said something <laughs> negative about mathematics. I see some fellow colleagues in here, so I think it's safe to say that not everyone said something <laughs> negative about mathematics. I think there's some other math lovers in here with me. Um, Woohoo, go math. But uh, oftentimes this is the case, right? And so I've been teaching math for 10 years, and so I'm not surprised when I hear people say that they've had a bad experience with math. Lots of people have, even people that do like math. Okay, I heard words when I was walking around like stressful, I heard that word. Um, I heard over with, I heard that phrase. I heard someone saying something about it, rather be at the dentist office. <laughs> <laughs> Because someone in here said that, you know who you are. Um, but I, I heard these phrases, and so I'm, I'm not surprised necessarily by this. Um, I've gotten used to the faces that people make when I explain that I am a math teacher. Right? <laughs> and so the most common reaction that I get when I say I am a math teacher is some sort of shocked look, maybe a disgust look, and then maybe some sort of phrase like this. So someone might say, oh, I hate math. That's probably the most common thing when I say, I'm a math teacher. I get, oh, I hate math. Like, I, ha I hate what you do. I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> um, but they might say, I hate math. I could never do that, right? Or I get a lot of, ewes. I have always been bad with numbers. My parents were bad with numbers, too. My whole family is bad at math. Right? Um, or maybe I'll get something like, I don't think I've ever did math outside of the elementary level, or I never passed geometry, you know, I'll hear specific references, or I really started to get caught up at this level of math. And so, while I'm not necessarily surprised by these reactions, I do get a little bit disappointed that as a society, generally, um, not only do we shout aloud, maybe our, dare I say, hatred for math, okay, not only do we shout it out, but somehow sometimes we almost brag about our number illiteracy. Okay? So we brag about it as if it was something to be proud of or if math was some sort of joke, which it's not, although there are funny <laughs> <laughs> There are funny math jokes though, but that's a different story. But it makes me wonder why is it okay and why has it become acceptable to be bad at math? <laughs> Right? So this makes me want to ask you another question. At the beginning, when I asked you to talk about reading, raise your hand if someone around you said something negative about reading. What? Not <laughs> one person? I think this is where I'm supposed to act shocked. What? Gasp? Okay, so <laughs> you mean no one said things like this? Oh, I hate reading. I could never do this. Right? Ew, I am so bad with letters. I mean, my parents didn't learn to read, so I didn't learn. My whole family just doesn't read. <coughs> or I don't think I ever learned to read past an elementary level 
I stopped reading at fifth grade, right? Like we, do, we don't hear these things. And not only do we generally not hear these types, yes, they're a little bit maybe drawn out here. We don't hear these types of comments, but our current society doesn't really brag about being illiterate when it comes to reading and writing. In my experience as a teacher, when a student does not know how to read or does not know how to write well, they oftentimes hide it, right? Or they fake their way through it. And they're very convincing at being able to blend in with everyone else because there's some sort of maybe shame associated with not knowing how to read or they want to hide the fact that they are illiterate from their neighbors and their peers. So I ask again, why is it okay that we're number illiterate then? So in my opinion, my opinion, just want to throw that out there, my opinion, um, announcing how horrible we are at math downplays the importance of math, critical thinking, and problem solving. It's sending a message that math doesn't matter. And it does matter, okay? So yes, I can appreciate the fact that not everyone loves math. I get that. And I can appreciate the fact that not everyone wants to graph a line or solve for x. But the root beauty of mathematics is everywhere around us, all the time, literally. For example, <laughs> math is everywhere. Okay? From the fractal patterns in the trees and the root systems of trees okay? to the way our brain sends signals to the rest of our body and the paths that it travels to GPS systems, which I think we all rely on on a pretty regular basis and the way they're programmed and the way GPS and Google Maps and all those different navigation systems are made to the way our planets orbit in that elliptical pattern, to even something more common, that's really fuzzy, um, like uh, deciding between items at a grocery store, right? Price comparison. All of these involve math, just some are maybe more obvious than the other. I read a quote recently, I thought it fit in well. Happens to be from a mathematician, because that's who I read quotes about. But um, <laughs> <laughs> he was also a philosopher, let's point out. Um, but music. So music is the pleasure the human mind experiences from counting without being aware that we're counting. <laughs> what? So math and music have this beautiful deep tie together. And as a society, we crave so much to be plugged in to our music, right? And all the time on campus, I'll see students with their headphones in. Sometimes they even try to do it during class time. That's how much they want the music in their life, right? And so we crave that music, but we're not craving maybe solving a trigonometric equation about sound waves. OK, maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just me. But they are deeply tied together. So bringing this back to Front Range Community College, I know that we have a lot of students on campus that struggle with math. It's obvious from the numbers in our help center to the new programs we're trying to initiate to just what we see day to day in our classes as a math teacher. And so maybe for that math class this is the last class that someone needs before they get their degree, right? It's the last finishing class. Maybe they've even saved it for the end, <laughs> right? As like a last hurdle to jump over, a last hurrah as they finish out their classes. Um, but we have to start changing the way that we talk about math to our students, to our colleagues, to our peers. Because it's our job to be instilling a lot of positive traits in our current and future students. We want to instill things like dedication and perseverance. Hard, uh, strong work ethic would be a good one, right? Problem solving skills, being able to uh, portray themselves and communication skills in a nice strong way, working in groups and teams. And I feel like that's part of our job at Front Range is to help each other as a community work on these traits. So a quick Google search, <coughs> gotta love Google, told me the top 10 traits that um, employers are looking for in future employees. And so if we look at this list, communication skills, Honesty, I guess that shows up a little bit in math here and there, right? Uh, being competent technically, work ethic, flexibility, 
determination, persistence, um, the ability to work in harmony with coworkers, being eager and willing to add to your already the, the knowledge base you already have, problem solving skills, loyalty. I mean, when I look at this list, how important are these and, and what better place to work on these, not only in a lot of classes at Front Range, but specifically in a math classroom. Right? These traits are coming up, even though maybe the graphing of the line is not showing up in the real world every day. The background of math, the backbone of math is. So I want you to think about the way that you talk about mathematics, whether it's your favorite subject or not. Okay. But the way we choose our words is powerful. As an advisor and as a teacher, do we describe classes as have-tos? Or do we use phrases like, get it out of the way? <laughs> I hear students say that all the time. I'm going to take this now to get this out of the way. I'm like, oh man, it's not the way we should be talking about math on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as a parent, how do we communicate and talk to our um, children about math. Do we use a positive attitude about it? Right? Um, do we project our past struggles that we may have had on our own experience onto their future <coughs> blossoming math um, adventures? Like, do we do that? Do we project that on them? Because I think instead of saying, oh, you'll never really use this, right? <laughs> Which people say all the time, you could say, Oh, well, you're working on your critical thinking right now. I mean, maybe there's a smoother way to say that. But the idea that you're saying, OK, you might not use this, but you're going to use this other aspect of what you're working on, the foundation of what you're working on. Um, instead of saying something like, oh, this is hard, and I can't help you anyway, because I hear that one a lot. I can't help because I don't know how to do this math. Right? It's beyond me. Instead of using phrases like that, we could say something more positive. We could say, well, I'm not really sure how to do this, but maybe we can problem solve together and see if we can figure this out. Right? Even as a society member, how do we interact with math on a daily basis? So I know for me, I can think of some examples. I work in the restaurant industry also, and I see all the time <laughs> that people struggle not only with making change, on a day-to-day -day basis. That is a skill that somehow we're struggling with right now. Um, but also calculating and adding tip percentages and adding the total of at the addition, the number skill of addition, a total plus a tip equals an amount. And I see that on a daily basis as a struggle. So how do I interact with that? I take it as a teachable moment. I always say when the person is at the checkout and they're signing their tip, oh, I'm not sure what this is. Can you help me add this? I get that one a lot. Oh, you can do it. Let's figure this out together. You know, and we, that's a learning you know, a teaching learning opportunity for me. Um, or even at the gym, which you might not think you're doing math at the gym, but um, at my gym, I like to go to the group classes. So maybe we're doing a similar workout across the entire group. And so I might take that time when at the end we're supposed to count how much uh, we lifted and weight totals or how many reps we did right, in this workout. I take that as an opportunity to help everyone around me when they want to go walk back to their locker bag and get their um, calculator out to get a total number on how much they've done. So I'll say something like, hey, instead of counting up all the reps you did do, why don't we just subtract how many you didn't do from the set? And that'll get us there faster, right? And so I use that. Everyone at my gym knows if there's something to add up, come ask me and I'll help you do it, right? And I don't do it for them. I, I help them do it, right? And I know I'm a math teacher and maybe that's a different setting. But just using that positive net language um, is a good place to start. So I guess what I really want to tell you is that if we have the right attitude and the right effort and we have that positive mindset, then maybe we all are math people. You might not think of yourself as a math person, but maybe you are a math person, right? If we use words like get to instead of have to, you're already starting to change that positive talk. And that's the biggest takeaway I want to have. Try to use those positive words instead of negative words. Even if you don't like math, you can say things in a more positive way so that we're not projecting our own feelings onto someone else who hasn't made their mind up yet about it. Our abilities in math are not fixed. And so maybe we just haven't found the right way to work with math yet. Yet. So again, that's all. <laughs>
enjoy an awkward pause. <laughs> <laughs> there are more carrot sticks while Mary gets hers set up, and then we'll do the intro and go right into the next one. If you didn't, I presented last year um, on uh, the Hegelian dialect and the power of consensus, um, but I started with a photograph of myself in a tutu looking really awkward like this. Because <laughs> that, that is me, I am awkward, so now yeah, I've made the awkward face twice in two years. Awesome! <laughs> Everyone stare at Mary. Um, okay, so this is Mary Brennan Housley. Um, initially, she studied applied math. <gasps> <gasps> applied mathematics. Um, and started her career as a data analyst in Arkansas. Uh, taking a leap, Mary left the information technology industry and math from behind a little bit um, to pursue a master's degree in student affairs in higher education where she then did have to do statistics, so math came back with a vengeance. <laughs> um, that was a negative word. I am so sorry. It's okay, it's statistics. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in 2012 as the Director of Student Success at the Long Speak Student Center and has the daily privilege of leading a team who is dedicated to student success, elevating the student voice and the integration of student learning into all aspects of everything that they do in and outside the classroom. In her spare time, Mary attempts to build life into life a sense of adventure and spontaneity. Her partner and two young kids come along for the ride, finding moments of laughter and always finding ways to make it back in time for family dinners. Mary also does handbell ringing with the bells of the Rockies. And with Andrew, by the way, who's oh. also math. Oh. So back to the math. Math. Uh, yes. <laughs> and um, is uh, continuing to try to keep up on her reading book list, volunteers at her children's school, and pays daily homage to the true rulers of her household, the two cats. <laughs> <laughs> so, without further ado, please a warm, happy conference. So I went the non-PowerPoint route. So for those of you who are sad about that, just reminisce on Sarah's slides. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be good. So. No, so I, I wanted to spend a little time talking about um, my journey and sort of what it's been like around my identity as being a white woman who's grown up in a middle to upper middle class environment. And when I think about when I was initially really exposed to what it meant to have systematic racism. It kind of started when I think back to my K through 12 education in seventh through 12th grade years. And so to kind of set the stage for you a little bit, um, in 19, for those who, brief history lesson, 1957, if you don't remember, the Little Rock Nine um, went to integrate Central High School after the Supreme Court ruled that black students should be able to go to white schools. And the governor sent out the Arkansas National Guard to surround the school to bar them from entering. And so, what that led to was sort of the crisis of identity within the, the county of Pulaski County, which Little Rock is located in. And lots of white families started to move. They started to pull their kids out of the school district. Um, it's called white flight, if you've never heard that term before. But what it led to was a lot of court cases and a lot of arguments about what was the plan to integrate the schools, what did it mean um, f to keep sort of a racial balance in schools? Was it just about numbers? Was it about how discipline is managed? Is it about the achievement gap? And so really debated those things strongly. And it reached the point after 30 years, they still hadn't figured it out. And so it went to a federal court in 1982, and the federal court said, yep, you all can't get it together. So those three school districts, um, one of which my family lived within, um, and they, um, so went under federal monitoring for the next 35 years. So if you do the math, um, it just ended last year that they were out from under monitoring um, federally whether or not they had managed to desegregate, desegregate the school systems in an equitable way. And so part of what they did when they were trying to figure that out was they would design programs that were trying to attract students to go to different types of schools. And so in my case, they developed a talented and gifted program um, with the idea, they put it in a low socioeconomic uh, predominantly black school and the idea was that they would bus in white kids um, and so they created this program because they felt like if they had something that white parents believed in and let's be honest I was going to school in Arkansas which I think the quality of education in Arkansas has been in the bottom five in the nation since I was a kid so if you create something that would entice parents to send their kids they would agree to let their children be bused and in my case I was bused 30 miles away to go to school it took me an hour and a half each way so I spent three hours on a bus every day to go to school 
um, to get this education. And there are times when, I, at the time, I was, I was 13, and, and let me tell you, I was pissed, because I, you know, 13, I wanted to go to school with my friends, and I got taken out of all of that. Um, and I don't begrudge my parents the fact that they wish for any, any parent, what any parent wishes for their children, which is a great education and, and to make a better life for themselves. And so, so they put me in this program and I started in the seventh grade and I was in the inaugural class, which meant every year they built on a new class. So um, we were the first seventh graders, the first eighth graders all the way through. And I say that because what happened is I got to watch both the students who were in front of me who didn't get to experience all these things and the students coming behind me that were recruited for often the same reason I was. Um, and what that transformation did both to those of us in the program and those in the school that weren't involved with the program. And I got lots of messages through this when I think about that, what they were choosing to do systematically for the education system. The first was is that clearly white was better and that white students were gonna come in to save the school. And I say that because most of the kids in the program were white students. Um, there was a few students of color, but it was a small percentage. Um, and their goal was to bring in white students to change the, um, the racial makeup of the school. Our numbers when we took tests were lumped in with the whole school, so it raised the overall bar for what was considered um, our success rate um, in the school. And I don't think they knew anything else to do. I think they were struggling. Um, there was three, again, three school districts, and so they were all, they didn't know what to do. And so this was the late 80s, early 90s at this point when they dreamed up this idea. And so the other message that I got was that it's worth it to spend money on what, was white, on what were white children. So they, I don't know how much, but my guess is, is they spent millions, not only on the transportation to get us there, because they were busing kids from all over the county, but they also spent a lot of money on equipment, on new classrooms. And the unfortunate part about all of this is, is it could have been something that was open to the whole school, which if you recall, I said was predominantly African American. So there could have been other schools that got to access these great resources and that's not how they designed it. And so I often wonder what would it have been like if they had taken those millions of dollars and just spent it on the school? Like if they hadn't bust us in, what would it, could they have provided better tutoring and support services to students? Um, could they have provided, if they were hungry, could they have helped them build a, an environment where they could learn better? Um, what would it have looked like to train the teachers on cross-racial support for the students in their classrooms? And instead, what they did was, we'll just bring in white students. Um, and I'll be honest, as a kid, I, I, I never saw it. I remember asking my parents questions around, why are you doing this? Why is the school district choosing to do this? And I was doing it from a place of frustration. Um, but looking back now, I'm able to kind of articulate, and here's the, here's the message that you sent to me and lots of other students along the way. So that was happening systematically. I also remember what happened at an individual level. So like, what was it like when I would build relationships? And so I remember the first time that, because right, there's lots of students in the school, so I would met lots of other students of color um, and developed relationships, sometimes romantic interests as teenagers do. Um, and so I remember the first time I came home because I had a crush on a black student in the school and it was reciprocated um, that he wrote the most romantic poetry. Um, <laughs> still remember. Um, and so I remember coming home and it wasn't the first boy I'd had a crush on, right? And so I came home and I distinctly remember not, the questions that I got asked weren't, what's he like? What's he like to do? What is he interested in? My, my parents went to a place of, and I'm 15 by the way, you know, if you marry this boy, you might not be able to bridge the gap that exists between the cultural values between your family and his. And at the time, all, all I, could, I was just sitting there going, I'm not getting married, dude. It's like, I'm 15. <laughs> that's, that's, <man. laughs> but in, re in retrospect, and when I can look back and think about how those questions showed up differently when it was a white boy, I, there's socialization that they had experienced a lifetime of that they were then passing on to me um, that I now have spent a lifetime and will spend a lifetime figuring out how to unlearn. And so I, all these things happen, right? So these messages that were happening at individual levels, the systematic messages, and sometimes there was dissonance and it didn't feel right, but I didn't know why. And so I just sort of tucked it away and I kept going. Um, being white at the time, I had a privilege to be able to do that and also living in a pretty, uh, there wasn't a lot of racial conversations happening about racial and race, racism and social justice at that point in my life. So I went on to college, and when I got there, got introduced to feminism, took an introduction to feminism course. 
loved it um, as a woman going into, I initially started out actually going into chemical engineering um, and settled on math. Um, so just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I did mathematics and computer science, and so I was surrounded all the time by classrooms full of men. When I was doing research, it was with men. And so I sort of found this affinity in this movement of people who really uh, identified with this idea of breaking barriers, the right to work, wanting equal pay, all these pieces. And so I really leaned into that side of my identity and who I was. At the same time, I also would hear stories and think back to my childhood and my childhood friends who would tell stories about their family, as kids do, um, and they would talk about what does it mean when you don't have a choice not to go to work. So I, I would, there was, again, this disconnect happening of I'd hear these stories in feminism, for example, around we don't want to stay home and have babies. Great. I'd hear my childhood friends, sometimes coming from lower socioeconomic class or families of color, where they're like, I don't know how to do anything but work. Staying home isn't an option. And so again, sort of seeing these moments in time where I'm like, okay, this doesn't match up. Like this, this movement isn't for everyone. And again, indulging my privilege and sort of just packing it away and not thinking about it. Um, and moving on and went into my professional career, my second professional career in student affairs. Um, and I had the chance to work with a coworker who identifies as a woman of color. Um, she's amazing. And it, this was the first time in my life I really began to question my own, I'm an ambitious person, <laughs> um, and I know this about myself, um, but it was the first time in life I'd ever begin to really start to question what does that ambition mean and what does it mean when I interact with other people. And so in the course of my time when we shared, um, we were both peers in the office, uh, there was a chance for a new functional area to come to our office. and one of us was going to get to oversee it. And she too had dreams of aspirations, of greatness. Um, she is doing great things today. And we had to decide who was going to get to take it, and it would have benefited us both equally. Because of who I was and all the socialization I'd had, um, all my, my sense of feminism and my desire to want to engage in the system and I wanted to make my mark and take a place in the hierarchy that existed, um, sometimes that was designed by men, um, and by white men more specifically, I had bought into that. I had bought into what it meant to be a professional and what it meant to be a good worker. And so when, we, when this moment in time came up where we had to decide who was gonna get to do this, she and I were both advocating, as I think anyone might in, the, in terms of your professional career, but I was advocating from a place of the establishment and the system and saying, I've, I've done all the right things. I've had seniority, I do projects well, um, I, I do what everyone asks me to do. So this means I get to have it. This other person could do those things well, she wasn't poor at them, but she also showed up with a whole other different set of values and a whole dif different other set of skills around building relationships with students. Um, she was very good at mentoring students of color. Um, she was a woman in a leadership role as a woman of color that was role modeling and mirroring to students in our community about what that meant, not only to white students to say, students, there are professionals of color who do this well, but also mirroring to students of color that you can do this too. And that was also valuable in the environment we were in. But that wasn't what the institution I was at at the time valued. And so in making that, so in making that argument, in retrospect, there's, I, have, I think back a lot of should I have been advocating for myself. And I think the answer is yes. But where I went wrong was not in advocating for my um, right, my own professional growth. Um, but where I went wrong was that I wasn't acknowledging in that moment of advocating for my growth and, and buying into the system, I was devaluing all the things she brought to ta the table, which were equally valuable and in terms of transforming the institution probably could have been more powerful. And so, and on top of that, I was telling a friend that what she showed, who she showed up as on a daily basis didn't matter as much. So needless to say, not one of the highlights of my professional career um, or of my friendship with her, to be frankly honest. And what happened, so shortly after that happened, um, I got the chance to go to a week-long immersion experience where we talked about social justice, race, oppression, power, and privilege. Um, and we did it through the lens of race. So we, we took one social identity to kind of delve in. And so part of that work while we were there is we would break into small groups and we call them caucus groups and we would do it by racial identity. And then we would come together and have cross-racial conversations. And so in one of those conversations, the cross-racial conversations, um, I chose to share my story about what had happened with my coworker. 
And at the time, the whole thing never felt good, but I still didn't quite understand the depth of what I had done and, and the pain I could have caused. And so I was sitting in a room full of strangers that I'd never met before, and I got an earful, um, and rightly so of people telling me, it was a safe place to talk, but people who didn't feel compelled to protect my feelings. Um, and what I heard from them was, you screwed up. You are perpetuating institutionalized racism in the place where you work. Um, and you've done it in a way that hurt a friend who may or may not have chosen to tell you what, how she felt. Um, but your intention, no matter how good it was, did not negate the impact that you had, knowing that she has probably had a lifetime of that happening to her. And so I left that whole experience um, pretty humbled and pretty raw um, in terms of really having my world turned upside down around what it means to really engage and really do meaningful work to stop um, the oppression that exists in the world around us. And so, sorry, I just lost my train of thought and I didn't flip my paper. I'm so sorry. And so some of the things I learned, one thing in particular was the idea that um, impact and intention. I'd spent a lifetime being told that my good intentions were enough. And to learn that they weren't was, a, was an interesting lesson to learn, I think. It was a hard lesson to learn and one that has stuck with me pretty intently um, throughout my lifetime. I think the other piece that I realized um, when I was there is that I'm capable of engaging these in conversations and I'm, cap I'm capable of hearing that I screwed up and that I didn't walk away, and that I stayed with the conversation. And I think as a white person, and specifically a white woman, I think that matters because it's easy to walk away because I don't have to, technically. Um, I could opt out as a white woman because no one's gonna ch challenge me to do otherwise if I don't choose to surround myself with those individuals. And so it's a journey that started for me many years ago. It's a journey I'm still on. Um, and I think I'll be on it until the day I die, of recognizing what it looks like to meld my social identities as a middle upper class white woman um, and how those things don't stand alone. And so when I say that, it was really easy for me at one point in my life to hide behind my gender and to say, well, I'm a woman and I've been in a situations where I've been oppressed and I've walked into rooms and not been taken seriously surely because I have different genitalia than the men that surround me, right? It's easy in that moment to go to a place of feeling like that's my oppression and that's my lived experience and that's what matters the most. But the truth of the matter is, is it isn't. Because when I think about, and for me this showed up a lot when I started, when I became a parent, um, when I think about what my son gets taught when I sit at the dinner room table with him, I don't have to talk to him about what's gonna happen when he walks out the front door. But when I talk about, sorry, when I speak with my friends of color, that have sons, they do. And that matters to them. And so, I also hate crying because I think white women cry too much. So just an <laughs> FYI, <laughs> just need to acknowledge that. Um, and I'm really uncomfortable. And I, and I think about that immersion experience I had, and I've never been more uncomfortable in my entire life. And doing this today was really uncomfortable, even though it deeply matters to me, because I think being vulnerable isn't something that's always celebrated. And I think taking the risk to have these conversations isn't always celebrated, um, and it should be. Because I think at the end of the day, I have to be able to, and I think you do too, I think we all have to be able to sit down and hear someone else's story, no matter what marginalized identity they're coming from, I think you have to be able to sit down and hear their story, believe it, and validate that what they are saying is true, that what they're saying matters, that no, you're not gonna try to justify away with some perfectly logical explanation about why the situation happened. But they, at the end of the day, it is what it is, and call it what it is. Because I don't believe that until we can be able to do that and be able to be uncomfortable, that we'll ever change this the system of higher education that we function within, and I think we owe it to our students to do so. And I think in doing so, I think that might be one of the only ways we'll actually be able to find our own humanity in each other. So, thank you. And come, Sarah. <laughs> so now we enter the uh, question and answer part of the thing. We, so we have about 15 minutes of just any thoughts, any reflections, anything you want to share um, related to either either one of the talks. Erin. 
Oh, this is for Sarah. Sarah. Oh, well, uh, for both of you, really. Um, I was recently working with a student who has been here for five semesters and has been able to put off math um, until that point. She's ready to graduate. It's the last remaining class, and she wants to transfer, but cannot until she gets through 050, 055, and the next math. So how do you feel about um, that just as a phenomenon, right? Um, but also about a, potentially a policy that might force students into a math class at whatever level at a certain credit point to avoid the situation where students leave, might potentially leave the institution without a degree because of one remaining math class. Yep, so um, again, personal opinion, uh, here, but I, I think it would be great because math is one of those subjects that builds on itself. And so, if you, the longer you take a gap in taking your math courses, mm -hmm. the harder it is sometimes for students to come back into it. And so, yes, there's probably a lot of fear about taking that math course. And now it's not just one course, it's actually potentially three courses that they probably need, which is going to take another year and a half, which is so discouraging. So, personally, I, I would love in a perfect world if, yes, that would be like one of the, you know, intro, that first year here at Front Range, you're encouraged to take some sort of math course, just to get started, just to get your back in the math action, so that that isn't happening. And so that if there is a struggle, maybe passing the first level, there's time to, to catch up to it. And so I personally would support some sort of catch, so that that's not happening. And also just getting that, that word out that we have a lot of resources here. We have our, you know, working on right now we have our um, help center we're, we're doing five day week math classes which I know isn't realistic for every student but for a lot of students that that is a huge help having that extra time in class to practice and get back to the group of things so I would love that how do we make that happen <laughs> don't be shy <laughs> Comments, anything, any reflections, things as you were listening that made you think, huh, wow, I had I'd never thought of that that way. Susan. Um, as a white woman who also grew up in the South um, during those times, um, I kind of, it's not exactly a question, I kind of want to talk about the difference between intention versus everything else and what everything else kind of in your mind consists of? In terms of what happens with the impact versus intention? Yes, versus like when you thought intention was, was just enough, then is it education? Is it acceptance, <laughs> listening to what people of color have to say? I'm just curious like what you've learned more. Uh, when I think about how, the messages I was sent as a kid, I think some of it, uh, my family is deeply religious, so I think some of it was rooted, was rooted in the religious belief system, but um, the messages I was taught was, it's always, it's okay if you meant, it's okay if what you said or did, um, if you didn't mean to, and as long as you say you're sorry and do better next time. So that was the messages that I got sent. But I think the part that that undermines is, is there's still harm that's caused in that scenario. Um, I did some restorative justice training at one point in my career, and it's that idea that in every situation that happens, um, you, must, you must bring the groups back together to talk about the harm that was caused to both groups and what needs to be done to repair it. And I think the saying, I'm sorry, and it's funny, even with my, my kids, I have to be careful because sometimes I'm like, no, say you're sorry, and they don't actually mean it. They're not actually repairing the harm. They're not actually recognizing the hurt they caused. And I think that's the part in terms of what, how I think I was socialized as a kid and even into you know, teenage years, of that that was okay um, and that, that that was enough just to say I'm sorry. But when I have talked with friends who identify um, as folks of color, what I hear from them is, is it's great, but I'm glad you're sorry and I'm glad you didn't mean to hurt my feelings. And when you are the 100th person who did that in my lifetime, when you're the 50th person who told me that being, that mentoring students isn't considered valuable professional work to, that should be considered when doing um, evaluations and promotions, 
it, it kind of starts to suck. <laughs> like, it, does, it doesn't matter anymore that, you, that people have the best of intentions because the impact is, is I don't get the promotion. I don't get to keep making a difference in the way that matters. My value system in terms of what I believe should be and what, how I believe life should move forward, I don't get validated in that being, a, in that being true. So. so just real quick, I wanted to add something. So you were talking about being 15 and, and dating a person of color in the South. When I got married, the first thing my grandmother asked was, is he white? Mm -hmm. yeah. That is a familiar question. Yeah. So. The next question was, does he go to church? Right. <laughs> so, yeah. right. Those are the two questions. Yeah. And I got to ask, where does he go to church and is he white? Yeah. There was a question over here. Yeah, um, so I guess building off of that, like, the pyramid uh, in, on a bigger scale, like, where do you think we can start as a society and a government with reparations, like, and where do we draw a limit, if, if so? I think for me the hardest part is I think a lot of times white people sit around and ask each other what is the limit and what should reparations be and I don't know that we always center, um, when you're talking about race in particular, I don't know that people, that we always center folks of color in that conversation in terms of what actually would feel equitable in that situation. And so for me that's really the first step is are we even asking the right people and are we putting the right leadership in place to be able to, to conduct those conversations in a way that's meaningful. Like, do you ever feel awkward, like, being around people of color? And, like, if you do, how do you deal with it? Um, I don't know if I feel awkward in particular in my, for, for me. I do know that when I walk into a room, um, I don't assume. I'm walking into a room as a white woman, and that's what someone sees. So I have to be thoughtful about assuming that I'm automatically going to be trusted, that they're gonna, I'm going to be seen as an ally, that they're gonna automatically assume I have the best of intentions because I don't know that that's always true. Depending on someone's lived experience, they may have had a lifetime of being around white people and those are all not, those are assumptions that can never be made. Um, so I, I think for me, when I, that's something that shows up for me that I'm always thoughtful around is I, I have to earn that trust. It's not, it's, it's not given. I just want to say I appreciate both of your perspectives. I'm a parent, I have a one and a three year old, and just the way I'm starting to interact with them now and trying to present, you know, maybe things that I didn't like growing up. I do love math, I'm a, I'm a math teacher. <laughs> other, <laughs> subjects, other subjects and other areas and other things, or even foods, or and how do we treat people, and it's just all of these things are coming up, and I feel like I'm relearning them from the beginning, showing them my, my you know, my two kids, like. How do you be a decent person in this world? How do you try new things? How do you accept others? How do you, and it's, it's such a good learning experience for me. Like, I'm recognizing all of these things that maybe I struggled with as a, when I was younger. And I don't know, I just want to say it, it just, both of your presentations pull out into my head and it just, it's really encouraging me to help the next generation be open and willing and just accepting of everything. So thank you. So I'd like to leave five minutes for less formal. Um, if people want to just come up and talk to our speakers one on one, and they don't feel as comfortable going, "Hi," <laughs> in the big audience while there's a camera. Um, so could we give our speakers uh, another round of applause? Um, please join us at our next session on Wednesday, October third. Our speakers will be Carrie Mitchell, English faculty, instructional coach, and online lead, who will give a talk called Helping Students Become Learners, and Jeb Hartman and Katie Wilson, who took Carrie's class, and they'll share their talk, Waking Up, and Why Sometimes Harder Choices Are the Better Choice. So thank you again, and please feel free to come up and just congratulate our speakers. Um, see you next time. Okay.